this video is about Tesla coils. This is the uh, basic circuit of what's called the Slayer Exciter. Uh, it's used uh, for electronic type Tesla coils rather than the spark gap type. And it's a pretty straightforward circuit. Uh, the biggest unknown is actually the secondary of the Tesla coil. And uh, we'll get into that and show you the mysteries of that. But basically we when the power first comes on, we turn on the transistor, current flows through the primary, which induces uh, voltage in the secondary, and due to the, the capacitance of the coil itself to the world around it, we can put current into the base of the transistor and start an oscillation. And uh, that's the basis of the operation, and uh, but let's go look at that coil and learn about it first, and then we'll come back and we'll start adding components to this circuit uh, to keep it from blowing up. If you watch uh, some videos on Tesla coils, uh, people seem to be delighted when they last for more than a few minutes. And uh, there's one particularly, particularly funny uh, video that I link below in the description, and I suggest you look at that. But uh, we're going to bulletproof this circuit as we go along. Okay, let's uh, investigate the properties of the uh, two Tesla coils. And uh, we're going to do that by feeding uh, a function generator through a 20k ohm resistor to the base of the coil. And then with an oscilloscope, we'll look at the voltage between the base of the coil and ground. And uh, here's a little bit of math that we're going to use to calculate the impedance of the coil uh, versus frequency. Now it turns out for a resonant LC ser series circuit at resonance the uh, impedance looks like a resistor and that resistor is the AC coil resistance. And we can calculate that resistance, which is the impedance, uh, at the series resonant frequency. Uh, now you say, uh, well, where's the capacitors? Well, first of all, when we connect to ground, uh, the ground goes on essentially to infinity uh, beneath your feet. And there's capacitance from the coil to ground and to the wiring in your building and to you standing nearby. And there's capacitance between the windings of the uh, coil. So we end up with a net capacitance from the coil to the surroundings. And uh, if you're not grounded, uh, you'll get different uh, conditions. But uh, we'll go to uh, the lab here, and with the oscilloscope, we'll look at this voltage as we change frequency, and uh, we'll calculate the impedance of the coil versus frequency. Now, this will be the series resonant frequency, and that's going to be the frequency at which our Slayer oscillator will want to run. Uh, there's also parallel resonances that happen, 
and they uh, show up at, as high impedance. So therefore, they won't produce much current into the base of the transistor. So we can uh, pretty much neglect the parallel resonance. And how do you get parallel resonance? Well, some of these capacitors go out two things and then come back here. So we end up with some capacitance like that. So there's a lot of strange things that can go on with the secondary coils of the Tesla coil. Here are two coils uh, for Tesla coils and uh, we'll make some measurements on their properties before we put them uh, into a circuit. And there uh, to the right is an oscilloscope and an oscillator which we'll use to determine uh, some of the characteristics of each of these coils. And here is uh, my way of grounding everything. It's just a normal line cord with just the ground wire separated out. The uh, piece of brass is just a weight to keep things from moving around and it's plugged into the outlet strip that uh, feeds power to my workbench. Okay, here's our setup. It's a 20,000 ohm resistor and it's connected to the output of our function generator and we're looking at the voltage on the coil side of the resistor with the oscilloscope and we're starting at a uh, lower a low frequency here of 80,000 hertz and the oscillator set for 20 volt peak to peak output and we have essentially uh, 20 volt peak to peak on the oscilloscope so there's very little voltage drop across that resistor right now so let's start increasing our frequency and you can see the amplitude going down as I turn up the frequency now I'm going to have to increase the scope gain to see it and there we see a minimum at 574 kilohertz. Okay, we're at our uh, first series resonant frequency. Let's go on up in frequency. We, we see our signal going up and then back down. So what this is is a parallel resonance. It's a high impedance. We're at 5 volts per division, so that's uh, about 17 volts peak to peak. So there's very little voltage drop across our 20k ohm resistor. So that uh, means we're at a high impedance point, and that's 700 kilohertz. So not that I, I don't think our uh, Slayer oscillator will r run at this parallel resonant frequency, but I just found it interesting and thought I'd show you. Okay, there we see another low impedance point. at about uh, 1.6 megahertz. And here the uh, voltage is not as low as it was before. That's about one and a half volts. 
So uh, this resonant point is a higher impedance than the first resonant point. And I've found that as I go on up, there are other series resonant points, and each one is at a uh, higher impedance. And I'll uh, chart all that for you here shortly. Well, let's go back to our first resonant point. I'm assuming uh, our oscillator is going to be running somewhere around that frequency. Okay, there's our uh, first resonant point. It's about 568 kilohertz. And I don't know if I can get back far enough to show you both. Uh, let me try moving this. But if you watch the scope and watch my hand as I come near the coil we can change the resonant frequency. And uh, it all depends on the capacitance between the coil and the ground and the wiring in the walls. And uh, we're in a metal building here. So it's the capacitance from the winding whoop, to the uh, environment that's going to determine the resonant frequency. And uh, I have uh, two metal cans here that we can set on top. And let's see what that does to our resonant frequency. Now you see the amplitude is quite high right now. Okay, that brought the frequency down to 498 kilohertz, or thereabouts. Even as I move around here, I lean forward and back, it affects uh, the capacitance to the coil, and thus the resonant frequency. Now I have a bigger can here, let's put that on. And we'll see what that did. Okay, now we're about 478 kilohertz. So what you do to the top uh, appears the more surface area you put up here, the lower the frequency. So I have some uh, cake pans here I'm going to put on and see what they do. Okay, there's the uh, cake pans on top. And uh, you can see the sig signal went full scale. And let's try and find the new frequency. Okay, now we're about 388 kilohertz. And of course the uh, lower the frequency, assuming, I'm assuming that our uh, Slayer oscillator is going to run somewhere near these frequencies, the lower the frequency, the less the switching losses in the oscillator. So, uh, and also we don't want to end up within that AM broadcast band. It will cause a lot of interference and the uh, Federal Communications Commission does not like that. 
So you see how you can adjust the resonant frequency of the coil. I just uh, remembered that I had a pizza pan with a hole in the middle that was left over from one of my windmill videos. So I stuck that on top. And uh, let's see what the frequency of that is. Okay, we can see it uh, really lowered the first resonant point to 320 kilohertz. Here's a uh, summary of the uh, coil data. Here we have the actual mechanical dimensions. We use the same wire to wind both coils. So it's the same turns per inch. And uh, we measured the DC resistance of each and the inductance, that's millihenries. And the resonant frequencies that we found, and it's probably the first frequency here that the uh, oscillator is going to run at. And notice on the small coil, the first resonant frequency is right within the USAM broadcast band. So you definitely don't want to run at that frequency or people with uh, radio direction finding equipment uh, may be knocking on your door. Here's a uh, summary of the various resonant frequencies uh, with various types of top hats. And uh, as is, with no top hat, the small coil and the large coil ran at these frequencies. And again, that's within the US AM broadcast band. So when we had the small can, the frequency went down and so on as we added larger things at the top. And in, in some Tesla coil videos, you'll see people used flexible metallic ducting to form a toroid to mount on the top. And here's the uh, dimensions of the uh, top hats that we used. Okay, here's the uh, smaller of the two coils uh, with the pizza pan on top and it's in a Slayer oscillator circuit uh, with a four turn primary. And uh, from our measurements earlier, we said with the pizza pan this should run at 321 kilohertz. So I have the scope just connected to a piece of wire laying on the bench here and I'm going to turn on uh, power to the oscillator. And here's the uh, signal that the scope's picking up. And it's hard to see but there's tiny little there, I think you can see it. It says frequency 334 kilohertz, 335, you know, in a period there of uh, around three microseconds. So it looks like our prediction uh, was pretty accurate. Within the uh, first few minutes of getting my Tesla coil working, I managed to burn myself three times. These two that I'm wiggling, I burned uh, while holding a screwdriver by, by a handle. And this one over here, I uh, uh, brushed up against the DC power supply and drew an arc. And uh, I thought I was being very careful and thought I knew what I was doing. 
So you can see how easy it is to harm yourself with uh, this kind of power. Okay, this might be a good time to talk about some of the dangers involved in playing with Tesla coils. And uh, for curious people, it's sort of like a moth drawn to a flame uh, to see these effects up close and personal. Uh, but be aware that there are some dangers. Uh, a lot of people think you're protected uh, at high frequencies because of the skin effect. Uh, but the skin effect only works uh, truly with uh, very good conductors like metals. When it comes to high resistivity conductors like human flesh, uh, skin effect is not very effective at all and currents can pass deep into the body. So, you already saw that it's easy to get uh, burns even when you think you know what you're doing. And when drawing uh, arcs, uh, ozone is generated and uh, uh, supposedly that's not good for you. Also, uh, Oxides of nitrogen are created, that's NO2 and NO3. And uh, don't uh, use uh, incandescent light bulbs nearby. Uh, X-rays can be generated when electrons hit uh, very heavy metals like tungsten. Uh, and also, you don't want to be inhaling transistor smoke. And uh, that seems to happen quite often. Uh, I'll show you how to prevent that as we go along. Uh, they say you, you don't get shocked from the high frequency because the nerves can't respond quickly to rapidly changing voltages. But we don't know if that can cause nerve damage. And you could also be heating internal organs uh, due to currents passing through the bodies. So all in all, uh, you want to be very careful. Investigate these things on your own. If you go to the Wikipedia article on Tesla coils, uh, there's a section about uh, skin effect. And that is not going to save us. So be careful. So how did I uh, burn myself on the power supply? Well, when I reached to turn it off, I happened to touch the uh, side of the box here, which is grounded, as is our negative lead here is connected to ground to the, that's the ground wire that goes uh, back to the power outlet. And our oscillator is also grounded right here. That's the negative lead also. Now my body has a lot of capacitance to the coil as I'm sitting right here by it. So basically the coil was giving uh, was coupling energy to me and from me it arced to ground. So uh, I'm wearing uh, rubber shoes and uh, uh, there's a uh, tile on the floor. Uh, I guess uh, it could have uh, just as easily arced uh, through my feet to ground. Uh, except uh, I was fairly well insulated. Okay, I learned my lesson about being burnt holding screwdrivers. So I made a magic wand here where I connected a, one of those cans to the end of a piece of CPVC pipe. And we'll draw arcs to that instead of to my hand.
And I think you can see I don't even need to touch it. Oh, there's several inches of arc. And then here's a, uh, a little neon bulb. And it's still lit way out there. So let's do the old uh, fluorescent bulb trick. Now I can feel heat here in my hand and I think that's high frequency penetration of uh, my flesh. So that's uh, all the tricks that people normally do. The pizza pan is steel so I used a magnet to attach a, a short piece of wire to the side of the pan. Here we can see we're drawing 2.6 amps and about 80 watts. Now here I've grounded our metal can with a clip lead. And uh, we'll run it again. interesting that the current goes down as does the wattage when we're drawing strong. Well, I'm uh, sorry about the audio on uh, the last section there. The uh, Tesla coil was interfering with the camera. Uh, you might have noticed uh, when I was drawing arcs, the sound level went down and uh, I had uh, a lot of problem with the camera freezing up and I had to do a lot of retakes. Uh, so that's why that uh, stuff was so shaky. So, but let's talk about how to make uh, your, your units survive a little bit. Uh, if you watch a lot of the Tesla coil videos on YouTube, you'll see uh, a lot of them blow up and uh, people are happy when they survive for a little while. But here I've listed the, the three major reasons that uh, a power transistor will fail. And the first one is over voltage. And uh, when the transistor turns off with an inductive load, like the primary coil of the Tesla coil, uh, you get a a rapid rise of the voltage on the uh, collector and if that goes above the uh, transistor rating uh, you can have a, an instant failure. So uh, that's prob probably the most common failure that I've seen. Now the, uh, this transistor is rated for 140 volts collector to emitter and 6 volts uh, reverse voltage from emitter to base. So uh, we need to protect that uh, base and that's why there's the uh, reverse diode uh, pointing from emitter to base on the uh, circuit diagram. 
Now the next problem uh, that can cause a failure is putting too much current through the transistor. Uh, now the, the highest current that I've seen uh, in any of my experiments has been roughly two and a half amps. So when we're operating at a 50% duty cycle, that's a peak of only five amps. And this transistor's good for a 20 amp peak and 12 amps continuous. However, that rating is based on the temperature of the uh, transistor itself. And uh, you can also destroy the uh, transistor just by running at a too high a temperature. So it's rated for 100 watts, but that's at a case temperature of 25 degrees C. And of course your heat sink is going to get warm, so this rating is no longer good. So what it really looks like, this is uh, temperature here, and this is wattage. And this would be uh, 25 degrees C. And out here is 150 degrees C. Now that's the uh, maximum junction temperature that uh, you're allowed with most transistors. So there's a linear D rating. So if, if you're out here at 75 degrees or so, uh, you may be down to uh, 50 watts. So this temperature is uh, correlated with the uh, heat sink temperature. Now what I normally do with any new device uh, is to run it for a short period and then feel the heat sink and see how hot it's getting. And uh, if it seems all right, run a little bit longer and turn the power off and touch the heat sink again and get a feel for how much uh, the transistor's heating up. And if you think it's getting pretty warm, then the best thing is to put a fan on it. And uh, the brushless DC type fans are uh, very powerful compared to the AC fans that are out there. So with these uh, things in mind, uh, let's look at our circuit and talk about how to bulletproof it so it'll last for a while. Here's our uh, basic circuit and we need uh, a diode here to protect the reverse base emitter junction and I usually use two. So we get a little higher reverse voltage uh, to help sweep out that uh, base charge. Now I'm just going to show the secondary coil right there. And here's our bias resistor. And that's 47K. Now when we draw current from our power supply, uh, due to inductance of wires and so forth, uh, to get good hard current, we need some capacitors here locally to draw charge from. And I happen to, to put four capacitors in parallel. and they're uh, 0.47 microfarad each. So it's roughly two microfarads to uh, draw energy from and put energy into. So this is the starting point. So let me show you physically what this looks like and what kind of voltage we get at the collector uh, with this circuit. Okay, there's the uh, four capacitors that I mentioned. And here's our two reverse diodes from emitter 
to base this is the collector here in the middle and this is the plus supply end of those capacitors and there's our 47k resistor going to the base and this white wire is from the secondary of the uh, Tesla coil itself going to the base. So from this side the red wire is the positive lead of the power supply and I also have the negative side uh, grounded. Here's the uh, power supply set at 24 volts and here's the collector voltage and it's zero at the bottom of the screen and that's 20 volts per division so we're hitting 130 volts already peak and the transistors only rated at 140 volts so if we raised our power supply voltage uh, we could easily uh, exceed the voltage rating of the transistor Okay, clearly we have to do something about this collector voltage. It's uh, getting very close to the breakdown voltage rating of the transistor. So if the uh, collector would go above the supply voltage, uh, we can dump some energy into a capacitor sitting up here. Let's do this. When the collector voltage exceeds the supply, the diode will conduct and dump some energy into that capacitor. And we need to drain that energy away. Uh, so this is a good place to put a little circuit that will also show us that the unit is oscillating. So let's put a resistor here and an LED. And for that LED to light, the collector has to be going above the supply voltage. So therefore, it will know that it's oscillating. And uh, I actually use two capacitors in parallel and they were each 2200 picofarads and actually for the resistor here I used two 1k resistors in parallel or in series uh, just to handle the heat dissipation these were half watt each and a, uh, a normal LED so this is, bas is called a snubber circuit because it snubs the voltage and uh, you may find different values work for your particular coil. So this is what I ended up and uh, I'll show you the uh, voltage uh, with this circuit in place. Okay, there it is soldered in place. This is the collector lead here the diode pointing to the capacitor, through the capacitors, to the positive supply of the power supply. Now let's uh, see what it does. Here we are with the power supply set at 30 volts and with our snubber in the circuit, our uh, collector voltage uh, just barely exceeds 80 volts. Okay, there's our uh, LED. Let's uh, increase the voltage of the supply and see when the LED lights up. There, it came on at about 10 volts. So we'll run her on up to 30 volts. And you see it just gets brighter and brighter. 
Okay, I think we have a circuit that'll stay together as long as uh, we don't exceed the uh, temperature of the device. Got to monitor that heat sink from time to time and make sure it isn't going crazy. So uh, that's how you make it last a while. So all you got to do is keep these things in mind and uh, you can build a Tesla coil that'll run a long time. And uh, for the next video, uh, we'll work on this guy. We already know what frequency it'll run at. And I think I'll use a power MOSFET on this one and uh, see what circuit components we need to make something that'll work. If uh, you got anything out of that video, uh, you could help me by clicking that uh, like button. And if you don't want to miss the uh, next video, be sure and subscribe. And in the meantime, you could watch these two videos.